Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Pop Cult X's special presentation of Latin Excellence Writers Roundtable. My name is Danny, one of your co hosts of Pop Cult X, and we are super excited to be hosting this inaugural event. As you know, we just wrapped up another year of Latino Hispanic Heritage Month, which included two episodes of Pop Cult X that focused on Latino actors and actresses and musicians. So, you know what? We decided to do one more. We have rounded up five fantastic Latino <laughs> authors with a wide degree of experience and hope that through this conversation, we can celebrate, support, and lift up not only them, but any and all Latino writers. Leading us through this discussion is Professor Frederick Louis Aldama, also known as Professor Latinx. He is currently the Jacob and Francis Singer Massacre Chair in the Humanities in the English Department at the University of Texas, Austin. Here, he also has affiliate faculty appointments in radio, TV, film, LGBTQ studies, Center for Mexican American studies, and Latin American studies. So, Professor Latinx, thank you very much for taking some time to, to guide us through this conversation today. We really appreciate it. Oh, man, it, what a huge honor for me, um, one, to be on Pop Cult X yet again, and also to be to have this huge honor of being with such extraordinary lineup of award-winning Latin excellent writers <laughs> who will share their journeys in becoming foundational figures in radically expanding and revolutionizing the Latinx storytelling arts. With us today, we have Alex Segura, author of Secret Identity, Star Wars, Poe, Damron, Free Fall, the Pete Fernandez Miami Mystery Series, and numerous comic books, including some exciting forthcoming comics, Aranya, Spidey, the Rene Montoya stories for DC. Yeah, I'm really, oh, God, as you know, big comic book nerd here. <laughs> so I can't wait for that. And uh, Gloria Lucas, um, one of, you know, our next up, an incredible writer, published fiction in the recently dropped Fiesta Nights and her debut novel, How Deep the Ocean Drops, like in a couple of weeks, really, right? Gloria, I'm so excited. Um, Richie Nar Narvaez is editor, poet, and short fiction writer, one of my favorites um, of many, Room for Rent in Latinx Rising, um, as well as author of books such as Hipster, Death Rattle, Holly Hernandez and the Death of Disco, Roach Killer and other stories, and Noir Yorican. Um, wow. <laughs> Ida Duque also published fiction in the recently dropped Fiesta Nights, as well as uh, rom-com novels such as The Humor of Love and The Academy of Love. Raquel Reyes is co-chair of Sleuth Fest and short fiction writer, as well as author of novels such as Mango Mambo and Murder and Hot Off the Press, Calypso, Corpses, and Cooking. It is my great honor to host such extraordinary talent here at this panel. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you, for Professor having us. X. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Professor. And thank you, Dan. So, Let's start with, you know, that story, that superhero origin story that you all have, which is um, when did you realize you wanted to be a storyteller and was there an aha moment? Was there um, some kind of shuttle from another planet that dropped you on this planet um, and you found, you found your, your, writing, your, your writing pen and, and went crazy? Let's start with Alex. Sure. No, I wasn't bitten by a radioactive spider or uh, found by <laughs> an elderly couple in a farmland in in the Redlands in Florida. But um, no, I think for you know, I think as kids, we always wanted to, we tell stories and we're not really sure what it means yet. It took me a while to like uh, you know realize there were writers creating these books that I was reading or these comic books. I was a big, you know, I started reading comics at a young age, and then that evolved into novels and things like that. And it was early on, like I think five or six, where I'd try to kind of rudimentarily draw my own superhero stories and comics and, or, or you know, you'd read a story and you'd, you'd think, well, what would happen if this character showed up? And you start kind of spinning out of things that you already know. Um, but it wasn't until I think high school when I, when I realized this is what I want to do. And, and, and uh, I went a circuitous route. I, I was a journalist for a while and then a publicist and a marketing person. And those taught me different kinds of writing, but um, it was a pretty instinctual thing early on for me. Mm hmm. 
Wonderful. Um, Gloria? Um, I think, so when I was very small, um, we, I lived in a single, you know, single mom household and I was the oldest of four and we lived pretty severely below the poverty line. And I discovered books and I discovered that books just brought me to all these different worlds and just, it was, I fell in love with it. And so I, I spent as much as, as much time as I could reading or in the library. And then I think, I, I don't remember how, but I realized that people, just people around us were writing these amazing stories. And I thought, oh, I, I didn't realize I could make my own stories. And so then I started writing as a, you know, as a young girl, kind of to escape as well, but just to create all these new adventures that I didn't ever think I really could do. And I began, I guess, publishing uh, short stories and creative nonfiction a couple years ago, because I finally got, I guess, brave enough to really put it out in the world. <laughs> like man who um, turned into a mountain uh, is a short story that I published um, in Palaver Journal. And I did a lot of creative nonfiction stuff about like my, my, um, my late husband passed away by suicide. And so there was a lot of personal things in that that I processed through writing. And now I'm finally getting into like, I guess my first love, right, is that the novels. And so my debut is dropping, like you said, in a couple of weeks. And I'm very excited Nice. about that. I'm very excited that um, I was able to be part of the anthology Fiesta Nights and stuff. So it, it kind of evolved, I think. And right now, the reason that I write and that I publish and I finally share is because I like to explore things that are a little bit more taboo, like mental health, um, loss, grief, things like that. Um, and I I think when you go through things like that, you're, you feel a little bit lonely. So you, you write it down because I think writing we all might know is a bit of a lonely thing and then you share it and you find your communities. And, um, that's, that's basically what my journey has been. So I'm very excited and very happy that, you know, I've, I've had the responses that I have and I can't wait to continue to, to write and put things out there. Wonderful. Very cool. Um, yeah, so powerful. Um, Richie. You're muted. You can hear me better now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry. So, yeah, my parents came from Puerto Rico, uh, Ponce and Corozal. Uh, they both, uh, neither one of them finished high school, but they really loved education. Uh, and they came here and um, uh, they, they had a strange relationship. My father uh, had another family, but he would come by every day and he would bring the newspaper and my parents would be reading every day. And they would tell me stories all the time, particularly my mother. She loved just going into these uh, reveries, uh, uh, talking about uh, life in Puerto Rico, uh, you know, the song of the Coqui, stuff like that. And so uh, I learned uh, with them uh, the love of reading and telling stories uh, and also with Stan Lee and consuming uh, uh, an inordinate amount of comic books. Uh, and I learned that I really loved um, writing, reading and writing as a venue for expressing myself. Uh, and it mm. really got turned up when I went to high school and uh, my creative writing teacher, Ms. Finnegan, uh, was really inspirational. She really helped me to understand how to craft a story and uh, to think about actually becoming a writer. However, uh, we were pretty poor. So when I went to college, I felt guilty about even thinking about becoming a writer because they're like, they don't make any money. They have to teach in order to make money, I should become a doctor to make my mother happy. Uh, so I really started on that path. I started going into to, to the sciences, hoping to become, you know, the nice doctor, get a nice car, buy, our, buy my parents uh, a house. Uh, but the fever was with me too strongly. And I started gravitating towards all the, the literature courses, all the creative writing courses. Uh, and eventually I wrote my first book, uh, when I was 20 years old, completed a novel. It is complete trash and no one will ever read it, uh, but it was a great learning experience. And at that point I knew that, yeah, I, I love this and I can do it. And it, it took a while, a lot of uh, stops and starts, uh, learning uh, where my groove is, finding my voice took uh, quite a long time. Uh, and then, you know, learning how to do it without 
Well, I can say I can't even say I was going to say learning how to do it without thinking about it too much that I don't know if that ever really happens. It's always a process of like, oh, how did I do that last time? So, yeah, it's a, a lot of inspiration from my parents and uh, a, a lot of uh, hard work over the years. Mm. Really interesting too, Richie, maybe later we can get back to this, that you f have focused more on short form. You mentioned that you 20 year old, you wrote a big novel. Mm -hmm. um, but um, anyway, we can, we'll okay. get back to that. Ida, tell us, uh, tell us about your um, start. Okay. Hi. So I actually had no idea um, when I grew up, what I wanted to be. I was like, you know, whatever. I like reading though. I always liked reading. Um, I moved from the Dominican Republic to Miami um, during high school and I didn't have an, an activity. I didn't have like, you know how kids have after school activities and friends and all that. I was new from, uh, from the R so I didn't know anybody. So I just went to a library and read. Um, so I remember every day just after school was over, I would go to the library um, here in Miami, you know? And then, you know, I went to college. I went to FIU, the local state college or university. And then um, I knew at some point I was going to have, I was going to have a story. I just didn't know what it was, but I knew at some point, because I think at some point you just have ideas that you want to share. So I just, <laughs> I just read. And then um, I worked in the nonprofit sector. Um, I for whatever reason, I wanted to change career. So I went into higher ed. And a month later of me being there, I had an idea. And I was like, oh, wait, I have to write this. So then I just started writing. Um, and then I had another idea. I wrote more. I wrote five books back to back. Just because I had no idea what I was like, okay, I'm just going to write it. So I just started writing. And then COVID hit. Um, I was in the process of editing the first one. But then COVID hit and that was it. Um, I got stuck in the fifth circle of hell, AAK, um, homeschooling. So, and I'm an extrovert. I like talking to people. So I got stuck at home for whatever month and I couldn't write, I couldn't do anything. So then um, when the COVID thing passed and the kids went back to school, I said, okay, let's do this. Let's just publish. So I published the first couple already. So, but... I read a lot. I can't say I wanted to be a writer my whole life. That was, you know, but I did like reading. I've always liked reading. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. And of course, you know, many, many writers um, now and before us, but way before our day have said that to become good writers, you have to be excellent readers. Um, so it sounds like that was uh, your path. Uh, Raquel, tell us about you. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, similar, huge um, library, you know, uh, that was kind of, um, you know, I, I was kind of um, spent a lot of time with my maternal grandparents and then my paternal um, bisabuelos. So uh, as an only child, I had to basically entertain myself, you know, and um, so the library was the best place, you know, <laughs> go to the library, you come back with 30 books and, you know, okay, you can be quiet and make everybody happy. But beyond that, um, yeah, there's a picture in um, my elementary school yearbook at St. Pat's, Miami Beach, um, of me accepting a creative writing award. Um, I wrote poetry from a very young age. I can't tell you why. I have no idea why I did that. Um, and then I went into, I remember in high school, um, we had a section on short stories and we were asked to write one and I did it pretty good. I remember like the feedback was like, and I was like, oh, okay, that's a cool thing. Okay. Um, and then I went into theater, um, but I was not the actor part of theater. I was the backside of theater, um, directing and screenwriting, I mean, you know, writing, playwriting and learning all of that structure and so forth and so on, you know, so, but I never thought I could. So, you know, I wrote half a dozen, uh, you know, skits and, you know, plays and one acts and all of that other stuff. But um, I don't think I thought about writing a full length until 
probably I hit 30 for whatever reason, you know, I had done the poetry thing. I'd gotten half a dozen things published and, you know, lit magazines and this, that, and the other. Um, I knew that wasn't good. You know, I also worked in nonprofit, you know, everything really low wage, everything I've chosen, theater, nonprofit, poetry, obviously. I need to shoot a little bit bigger in my next life. That's all I'm going to say. But um, yeah, so I've always, you know, um, kind of been writing, but writing a full length is a different beast completely. And, um, you know, you had mentioned in, in the bio that I am um, a co-host of Sleuthfest, which is a craft conference, a writing craft conference. You know, I learned a lot just volunteering for this writing craft conference and taking these classes from masters and these workshops and so forth. And so, you know, I kind of learned the big thing, that novel, that beast later on from just, you know, like little bits and, and little pieces and, and putting that together. Wow. Amazing, amazing um, stories and journeys, origin stories and journeys. I want to ask now, um, very uh, from listening to all of you and coming from all of these different places, um, these different experiences as Latino, Latine, Latina, Latinx, very much integrated into, of course, your work. Um, have you, was there a moment when you were like, okay, I am like a Latino writer, Latina writer? And, and a follow-up to that would be, was it in reaction to obviously maybe things that you weren't seeing or um, like wanting to take that challenge as, uh, you know, Raquel, you just mentioned, you know, taking on these things that were low paying, you know, the challenge of pushing our stories into a literary marketplace that has for so long been gatekeeping those stories. So it's a two-parter, take it however you'd like. And let's start with Richie. So uh, uh, how did I, uh, how do I write as a-, as a Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those like questions. I mean, we, it, it's more like, was there a moment when you were Richie? Like, I am not just going to write um, Roach Killer and other stories. I am going to write Roach Killer and other stories that really pulls from I'm I'm just using one example pulls right, right, yeah. from from this space that I feel like hasn't been getting has been been uh, under the surveillance gatekeeper you know guy uh, you know gaze for so long this is what I'm doing right something that sort of yeah when when I was really really first started writing it was the 90s and I had come out of a uh, uh, the, an, a master's degree program, and we were we were given all the regular stuff, and there were was almost no. I don't think there was any uh, uh, Latino Latinx writer that we we de- stu- we studied back then. The big writers uh, who were were like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, uh, um, and then uh, Ernesto Cisneros was the next bis- big one. But there were very few and far between, and they were doing a certain kind of writing. And I thought, well, you know. I write this stuff that is um, that is fairly uh, dark, uh, features a lot of crime, and uh, often I think has an edge of humor. I I, I think it's funny anyway. But um, nobody else was doing this kind of work, and I was like, well, this is kind of a nice uh, niche that uh, nobody's doing, and nobody's really writing about Puerto Ricans or New Yorkans anymore. They had been written about uh, during the uh, the big New Yorican era in the in the 60s and 70s, but that had kind of, uh, in a sense, slowed down and, and had been pushed aside. No one else was writing new stuff uh, or, or wasn't getting a lot of visibility. And I thought, well, maybe somebody should write a little bit more of this stuff. And, and this is who I am. This is part of my identity. And I was, when I wrote, all my characters generally were New Yorican, Puerto Rican, uh, every once in a while, I would try to turn out a, maybe a science fiction story or a horror story where they weren't like that. Um, and, and it worked maybe sometimes, but uh, it, it really feels truer to me and, and feels like I'm actually doing something. Uh, maybe that sounds pretentious, but I actually am doing something when I'm writing about my people and writing about uh, the experience of my people. Um, 
it, it feels a little bit like it, it matters a little bit more. So I feel more satisfied when it's done. So any particular moment? No, it was always something that I was doing. Mm. I think only after a while, once I started writing more crime fiction and horror, I realized this is an important pocket. And even though a lot of people think of this kind of writing maybe as just entertainment, there's a possibility here. There, there's, there's something here where I can say something um, about mm. Uh, where I came from and the people, mm -hmm. my people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful, um, Alex. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so identif identification is so important to me. It it resonates really strongly with me as a reader, and I I remember really vividly as a child. You know, as a child who read a ton of comics, it's mostly like steel jawed, middle aged white guys as the superheroes. And I remember um, Marvel came out with this character Spider Man twenty ninety nine who's a Latinx Spider-Man. He's in the future and he's half Irish and, you know, there are all these kind of qualifications on him, but he's, that was the first moment that as a reader, I looked at what I was reading and I identified with the character and that resonated with me. And there were other moments like that, you know, Aranya, which is a, another Latinx spider character, Rene Montoya, who's a Latinx cop in the Batman mythos. Um, all characters that I've been blessed to write now, which is kind of weird and wild to think about. But um, as a writer, I loved PI novels. I loved, you know, the classic PI novels like Marlowe and Lou Archer, but also newer stuff like George Pelicanos and Dennis Lehane and Laura Lippman. But um, I was really tired of always seeing if if I saw a Cuban character, seeing them as the gangster, as like the Scarface type, or as the comic relief to the main character who's white. And I felt like, you know, crime fiction, like Richie was saying, to me, isn't just about genre or about entertainment. It's it's a way to spotlight society. You know, it's you can have your vegetables and your dessert at the same time. You get to learn about the world around you. You get to learn about other cultures and other people and other lifestyles and other worlds. Um, while still being entertained by something that's a pot boiler or, or you know, uh, compelling reading. So I wanted to see myself on the page, not literally myself, but someone like me, someone that went to, you know, went to FIU or someone that was Cuban American, someone that was younger, not like an ex cop that was like, uh, you know, I wanted to take the tropes that I read and enjoyed and run them through the filter of my culture and my background. And, and it's something that I do in everything, you know, I create superheroes that are Cuban American. Every every character I've created has some aside from Poe Dameron, who I did not create, but I got to write, and who's also a Latino as well in in his own way. Um, you know, you put a little bit of yourself in your characters because you hope down the line someone is going to read that book and, and identify and also you know pay it forward. You know, it's about you know spreading spreading it out and making sure that people can recognize themselves in the characters you're writing about because that had such an impact on me as a kid that I, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I hope that someone is reading these stories and realizing that they can be the protagonist of these kind of books and these kind of adventures. So. Mm, absolutely. No, for sure. For sure. We see it everywhere. I see it right now in the, in the um, Texas Latino comic-con, which is happening literally right now. In the yeah. I wish it was there. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gloria, let's, let's hear from you. Um, so I don't think I have, for the most part, when I started writing and then um, when I first started publishing, I didn't set out to be like, I'm this Latina writer. I have to write about Latinos or Latinas, um, but I'm Latina. So it, it comes out no matter what, you know, there's going to be little marks of that culture. And um, there are characters like for How Deep the Ocean, the main character is Mexican-American. And so, um, you know, that's that's me. And so I understand that culture a lot better. Um, and so I did get a little bit nervous and I think I was like probably reading too much on Twitter on like advice and stuff, which I stopped doing where people are like, how much do you put in? And so then I was like, wait, do I have to represent for more? You know, that, that kind of, I don't know, like when you're in a minority group, you're, you're like the representative. So I'm like, oh no, what if I do the grammar wrong? Or what if it's in, I was like, you know what, Gloria, just stop it. Just write it the way you're supposed to. Um, the way that you want to, because this is your, this is your book, this is your story, um, and stuff like that. So I, I still, every now and again, will feel a little, I guess, I don't know if it's hesitation or, or nervousness of, am I presenting this, you know, Latino character, usually Mexican, because, you know, Mexican is my, my background, my, like, I know that, that is what I know, and um, am I presenting it in a way that is a good representation of them, and 
of us, my family and everything. Um, so there is, I think that kind of like, uh, I don't know, but, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's how I've felt it as I'm writing. Um, but I know like my, my fiance right now, he, he made a comment and he, um, he's like, you know what, and how, in both how deep the ocean and in the short story and fiesta nights, it's un cafecito midnight. He's like, your character, there's like a scene where you're drinking coffee, like really late at night. He's like, it would have never dawned on me to do that. And I was like, really? I'm like, we do that a lot. I feel like we all do that a lot. Like, cafe and, and really late is not a big deal. So I didn't even, I didn't even think that that was a thing that was a cultural identity thing, I guess. But um, there was a couple of other friends that I had that had said, like, I do that too. And I do that too. And I started asking around and asking questions. And um, I think sometimes that culture just kind of comes out and is just there on the paper because that's who you are and I try my best to write characters and write um yeah I guess write characters that are that people can identify with so I'm very hopeful that I create great characters and, and just very real people even though I write fiction still very very real people and hopefully I do a good job and I do sometimes touch on maybe the Latino American experience where maybe there's a character who's Hispanic but doesn't speak Spanish which I know is like a big thing like do you speak Spanish now no I don't well now I'm a bad Latino or Latina and kind of touching on those things not in a way to to lecture but just to kind of give a glimpse I guess to the average reader of this is kind of what it is to be Latino or Latina in, in the United States usually yeah that, so yeah beautiful <laughs> no, yeah, so elegantly expressed. Thank you so much, Gloria. And you bring up a really important point about um, the fact that even though we are all doing um, and creating and putting putting our stories out into the world, we need more because in the end, we still are, sh you know, we are still put, we are still saddled with the burden of representation so anything that we put out you know there's inevitably someone's going to say well you didn't do enough of this and it's because they're hungry for it our readers our viewers our you know our audiences are still hungry for that big wide spectrum of stuff and um you know there's still a lot of gatekeeping going on but okay let's hear from uh raquel and then ida okay so um yeah it's kind of my thing uh, from the get-go. Um, so a little bit about me is that um, my mother is um, white American, Southern actually, and my father is Cuban. Um, and so I divided my time between those two families. Um, I've always said that um, I Love Lucy was the reason why I knew that I was okay because there was a redhead married to a Cuban because my father, handsome man, anyhow, very Ricky Ricardo. Anyway, um, so that representation was huge to me because I got to know that I was okay. But then as you grow up and you're going along with your life, you know, trying to, to do your stuff as a kid, you know, as we're learning and splitting between these two cultures where you're not enough of one and not enough of the other or vice versa, um, I very much, and probably as an only child with in the company of adults so much, I heard all of it. And um, I, I had one, one poem that was published, I think it was pu published in Sojourner, was, um, uh, so we're back to color again. Um, and that has always been a constant thing. Another poem that I wrote really young, I'm like, I barely out of my twenties or in, you know, just, I'm, maybe even mid twenties, early twenties. I don't know. This was when I was writing this stuff was I can pass because everyone would assume my identity because of the way I looked. So, oh, well, you're Mexican. Oh, well, you're Indian. What are you part Cherokee? Cause I happen to be in Georgia because they love that stuff, but that, that's everybody thinks they got to, you know, whatever. Right. Or, in the airport, I used to wear bandanas on my on my head. Um, I was kind of a nature girl, and uh, men would just come up to me and go, "Oh, are you Muslim?" Because I covered my hair. I mean, I had every single identity because of like I'm this ambiguous, you know what? I don't know that kids now coming up 
maybe facing those exact things. Um, because I do think the landscape has changed slightly. Um, but for sure, I encountered a whole lot of that. And every single piece I wrote had that element in it. And I'll bring it back full circle. I knew because of I Love Lucy, because of Ricky Ricardo seeing him on TV, right? And I got a whole Ricky Ricardo thing. He actually went to my, he went to my school down in Miami Beach. But anyway, that's a big connection there. Um, like I've never met it. Well, I didn't mean it, but anyway, um, my point is, is that that validation that I knew that I was worthy, right? And then to have other people come at me and questioning what and who I was, there was just something in this like quiet little kid was like, no, this, I'm going to be talking about this and talking about this and talking about this. And it's been in my work from the, the first ever that I could start writing about it. And I hope that there's a day that I don't have to write about it as in, you know, exerting my, my, my identity where I can just write without any questions on it. Do you know what I'm saying? We're not there yet. So. Yeah, we're not there yet. Uh, but of course, with all of you doing the incredible work that you do do, maybe we're getting a little closer, right? Um, Ida. Yes. Okay. Um, so I wrote four novels back to back starting in 2017. And then in the summer of 2019, I went to RWA in New York. And I was there and I was walking and I see Priscilla Oliveras and she has, she has, she has something that said Puerto Rican or something, a shirt. And I was like, oh, uh, you know, I'm Dominican, whatever. We start talking. She goes, hey, come to the bar later. I'm rounding up a bunch of Latina romance writers. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went down there and there were like 20 Latina writers that she rounded up. And I was like, oh my God, how did, where did you find all these people? So Priscilla Oliveras went around WRA getting people and inviting them to the bar. So then they were talking about the characters, how they're writing Latino characters, how they're doing this. And I was like, oh my God, I want to do that. So I went back and changed my novels and put a bunch of Hispanic characters in it. it didn't, they started normal because I didn't even think about that until I was there and I met all those people. And I was like, oh my God, wait, it's fine. I can just put all this, I'm in Miami, I live in Miami. We're all Latinos. So then I went back to some of my novels and now all of my characters are Latinos, Cuban, Dominicans, yeah. So that's when I, that day, that's when I said, okay, this is happening. We're doing this. I'm putting all the Cuban people in here. So I'm surrounded by Cubans. I'm Dominican, but I'm surrounded by Cubans. So yeah, so that's how that started for me. Yeah, also, oh, so incredibly important. Um, and these big, yeah, well, we need it. As I mentioned before, I mean, you know, it's like in the Heights, everybody jumped on it and started crit criticizing it. And it's like one when we're only given a certain amount of airtime, it's inevitable that we're going to jump on the one or two or five or 10 things that are, you know, kind of coming out because we, like I said before, we're kind of still shouldering that burden of representation just because we don't have enough out there. And that leads me to my next question about gatekeeping. Um, it, was there a moment uh, and you don't have to name names if you don't feel comfortable, um, where you really just felt like you were through, you were going to throw your hands up. It was, you know, um, with the system that's in place and for getting our writing, our voices, our stories out there. So Richie, let's start with you. Um, I would, I mean, the thing is like, the thing about gate, gatekeeping is they don't always tell you we're keeping you outside the gate. They don't announce of, themselves. Yeah, they don't announce <laughs> themselves. So you got to have to, you sort of have to intuit. Well, wait, is this because, uh, and uh, the thing is with me, um, I'm in a country uh, 
that is uh, run by people uh, with light skin, I am very fortunate to be light skinned. So I think it has actually helped me, for example, in my job career at the same time when I walk in and because I speak uh, you know, I grew up watching PBS, so I, I speak with maybe a little bit of a Brooklyn accent, but uh, uh, in a fairly sort of uh, what's speak not pretty. stereotypical. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing with um, the gatekeeping, I think, is because my last name screams my ethnicity. You know, there's no way around it. Um, so when I was sending out hipster death rattle, I kind of got the impression that it was not getting through because of that last name and that I, I actually had been tempted years before to change it to either a easier sounding, uh, more, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, yeah, easier sounding Latino name, something like Santos, my mother's last name, something more uh, digestible uh, for the mainstream, mainstream crowd. But I don't know. I, I wanted to stick with it. I wanted to see what would happen. I didn't really want to change. Um, and, you know, a lot of people stumble over my name uh, and that's fine. I know that that's, you know, a learning curve for them until Narvaez becomes a, a household word. But um, yeah, I think it was particularly with hipster death rattle. I, I definitely felt that there was a wall there, uh, but I could, you know, of course, couldn't get any confirmation, but I did, did feel that there was a, there was a gate that I wasn't being let through. Alex, I, I want to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like Richie, I also am light skinned and have benefited from that. Um, and, but I can also, I can't count the number of times people have looked at me and said, Oh, you don't look Cuban or I didn't think you were Cuban or, you know, will try to speak to me in English when I can speak, you know, Spanish was my first language. So, I mean, I can, you know, it's, there's, there's, you know, I could, could relate to what he said. Um, I remember pitching Silent City, my first novel, to hundreds of I tell new authors this all the time, like be ready to pitch hundreds of agents and be ready to get two or three responses. Um, I pitched every publisher without an agent. I pitched every publisher I could. And I had I was enough of a reader that I knew without ego, this was a good PI novel. You know, this did all the things that PI novels do. And the the default answer I got was, you know, oh, the PI novels kind of and over. Nobody likes PI novels anymore. Um, and then I'd look out and see, you know, hundreds of PI novels on the shelf. And it's just one of these things that after a while you start to wonder, you know, is it because it's about a Cuban guy who doesn't fit the mold of the usual private eye? And I didn't, that didn't deter me so much as give me more motivation to keep plugging. You know, if anything, I'm stubborn, you know, talent, you know, I work hard, I work hard, you know, and I have some talent, but the thing I do really well is I'm stubborn and I will keep trying. Uh, and so I just kept plugging and eventually I had to basically self-publish Silent City. The first edition of Silent City, Richie remembers this. We were kind of in the trenches together around then, um, but it was from a micro publisher and it was basically self-published. And then I got my agent and then I got the publisher that eventually published the five P Fernandez novels. But um, it did feel like the, the hill was a little, a lot steeper. Uh, it felt like there was this sense that the the interest wasn't there. And this was before, I think, where we're, we're at a really great moment now. It can always get better in terms of diversity and inclusion and community. You know, we have crime writers of color. We have other networks where we can all talk to each other and compare notes and really build a bond in, and, and connect and help each other. But I think back then we were the novelties, you know, we were, oh, you're, you're a Cuban guy that writes a mystery novel. That's cool. And you're on a panel with, you know, five other white guys. And it's, it's, you know, it's not to be this or that. It's, it's just, I felt less, I felt much more isolated then. And it felt much, much harder. And now I think it feels like we're helping each other and that's really a blessing and something that I'm, I'm so happy to see. And it can definitely get better. It can always get better, but um, it was hard. Yeah. That first book was really hard to crack. Ida. So I actually, when I went to RWA in 2019, I actually pitched to three people. I didn't even know anything about that. I was clueless, brand new. And then one of the people that was with me was like, oh, I'm pitching, come with me. Um, so I pitched to um, an agent and two editors, I think it was. Um, and then one said no immediately. She was like, oh, it's not original enough. The other one, a couple of months later, is not original. And then the third one never answered. And I was like, 
I have read about people getting rejected over and over and over. And I was like, yeah, we're not doing this. This is not happening. Um, I actually have marketing experience, so that didn't bother me. Um, my background, I did event planning. I did all these things. So I was like, marketing, not a problem. So I'm, I'm self-publishing mine. I'm, three was enough. I wasn't going to pull myself through like rejection after rejection. That's just, so yeah. Maybe I'm impatient. I don't know. I just, I didn't see myself sitting there doing that not only three times, but 60 times. It just, yeah. I'm mm. not that young. I'm old. I mean, I'm not that old, but yeah, like 10 years. I, I met somebody mm. at a workshop that had been waiting for like 10 years. And I was like, yeah, no, 10 years. I'll be 50. God knows. No, no. Absolutely not. Mm. No, that's. So, I'm glad you brought that up, Ida, because um, <clears throat> you know, especially today with the technologies and and platforms where we can reach and do reach and grow our our readers, our audiences in a way that kind of um, agent maybe he wasn't to editor before. In, yeah, in the past you couldn't, but now you can. Like, yeah, I, absolutely. I Absolutely. I made my own team. I made my own yep. team. I, I contacted a few editors. Okay, I like this one. Now I use yeah. her. I tried a yeah. few proofreaders. A couple of them were not so good. Now I found somebody else. So, no, you know, it's great. I, I'm doing I love everything. It. Really inspiring. I didn't. Yeah. And I get it. Some people, like I, I met somebody that had been waiting for like eight years. And then by the time he mm. published 10 years, mm. I just didn't have the patience to go through that process. Mm. But I mean, if, if somebody wants uh, to do it, they can. It's not, mm -hmm. It's very personal. It's your decision. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do it. So after I got the three rejections, I was like, yeah, we're self-publishing. We're mm -hmm. not sitting around. Yeah, no, no. Great. Gloria, do you want to share? Me muero. I would have died. Te imaginas? Me muero. Esperando aquí, cortame las venas. No, 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 no. Um, well, for me, the gatekeeping, I mean, I, not to, I guess, put the sexism thing out there, but I'm a woman and I've worked in male dominated fields before. So I understand that sometimes there's that stigma or there's just, I don't know, prejudices that exist. And so um, it's not disheartening to me per se, because I've already experienced it and stuff. I was in the Navy and so uh, for seven years and for a very long time, I had men who I respected and thought were great, you know, um, people to work with come up to me and say, like, you don't belong here in the military because now, um, you know, we go up to the flight deck. Uh, I worked in aviation. I was like, the, I was an aviation electrician. So I worked on the wiring and stuff like that on the jets, the F-18s. And they would be like, well, now, nowadays, the flight deck is full of men wearing cologne and before when there was no women in the navy nobody cared and I was like I don't know why that's my fault but okay and so I kind of come from that sort of experiences and um so as I'm starting to publish and all of that a lot of people were like oh don't write that your name is Gloria you know you need a pen name um or maybe a name that sounds more like a man or like um you know maybe initials and then a last name and things like that so you're not I guess the gatekeeping doesn't happen for just like publishers, but also sometimes readers, right? So sometimes the readers are, if I publish something like How Deep the Ocean, normally um, it's like, it's literary fiction, I would say, um, but it also falls under women's fiction. And I learned that women's fiction is just a heavy event that happens to a woman. I'm not really sure what you would call that for, for a man, but um, yeah. And then having characters that are primarily Hispanic, there's a lot of people that are like, well, are you sure? You sure you want to do that? Because if you do, then that might be a little too niche. And it might be just maybe Latinos that are or Latinas only, like going out and getting that story or novel or book or whatever. And I think that I'm very stubborn as well. So I get to a point where I'm like, you know what? No, my name's my name's gonna be on there. It's gonna be Gloria. And people will know it's a you know, I'm a woman and I'll have my Hispanic and Latino characters and it is what it is. And maybe I won't sell as many, but that's fine because I feel like if we don't, if we don't keep pushing it forward, then it's going to continue. White is going to continue to be the default. Um, 
men are going to continue to be the default instead of it being kind of a balance. And I would love to see that balance where it doesn't matter if the story is good, it's good. There's no presumptions or prejudices around who's writing what and stuff like that. And I think also I, I carry that the same thing where my mother is Mexican. She came from Mexico um, and I'm first generation American on that side. But my dad, who I didn't grow up with, is, um, I don't know, just generic way. I'm not really sure what the background is. Um, I think he's French and something else, but obviously I'm very light skinned. I'm very white. I, I you know, I, I speak with some sort of accent, but maybe a very just general one that's hard to pinpoint. Um and so I kind of blend in. I, I felt like growing up I didn't really fit anywhere. So I'd have a lot of people saying like, well you don't look Mexican or even even Mexicans, uh if I I'm around and start talking Spanish. Like, oh, you're from Mexico. Oh, okay. Your mom's from Mexico. I, oh, I didn't know you were Mexican. That's weird. Like, you don't look that. You look something different. And so I'll hear all sorts of stuff. Like, are you Puerto Rican? Because you're very light skinned. You look American. And maybe that's why. And um, so I get a lot of that sort of stuff. And so there's a lot of gatekeeping, I think, around the stories that I write um, to people that don't really know me. Because uh, I think that there's that hesitancy of, like, wait, are you? writing about Mexicans and are you sure you know that culture I'm like I, I grew up in that culture so yes and I think um like I forgot who someone else had just said you're not really it's not like they have a pin on their shirt saying like official gatekeeper of something so it's sometimes hard every now and again I'll I'll think like am I just projecting am I just am I thinking that this loss of a maybe a publisher is because of that i have my name there as Gloria or maybe I'm just overthinking it and things like that um but yeah I, I feel like sometimes it's, it's difficult and then trying to wedge your story and, and the normal yeah I guess the norms right and so that that show don't tell you can only show if people know what you're talking about and so if you're talking about a maybe that's something that's a little bit too I don't maybe this is a minor example, but like the coffee thing, like maybe having to explain that, oh, you know, drinking coffee very, very late isn't that big of a deal or isn't outside of the, you know, it's a cultural thing sometimes. So sometimes you have to tell a lot more about the culture because you're writing to an audience that may not know that. And so following the normal rules sometimes don't, it doesn't apply, I guess, to the, the story that you're writing because of what you're writing about. But at the same time, it's judged by the normal rules, which is difficult because I have had some editors look at my work and say, like, that doesn't make sense. And I'm reading them like, that makes total sense. I don't understand. And I think the difference was that cultural background, if, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, Raquel? Did you want to add something? Yeah, um, I can add that, you know, you had asked if you at some point you were going to quit. And I was absolutely, if, you know, going to mm, have quit, mm. I don't know, a good five or six times. Um, but this last time I was like, for sure. I was like, okay, I'm like going to stop submitting and pursuing. And I'm just going to be in the community. Like I'm going to do advocacy in the community. I mean, because I've been doing this for 20 years, I have a pretty good network, you know, I, I, you know, I feel like I kind of, you know, know people and I was like, well, I, I will be, I will serve this genre that I love more if I maybe shift and pivot and go into advocacy instead of, you know, trying to get my story out, right? But then something like amazing happened. So, you know, something happened in the publishing industry. We had, we want diverse books um, for the children's, right? Um, RWA had this lovely, beautiful um, explosion that we all watched on Twitter to do with the Rita Awards, right? Um, YA was doing great stuff. And then in our genre, this top row over here, Alex, Raquel, and Richie, we know, um, who because we all write crime fiction, um, you know, um, uh, Kelly Garrett, uh, Walter Mosley, and Gigi Pangian uh, got together and uh, brought together, I think at first we were only 30 people. It was like in late 2018 or something like that, um, Crime Writers of Color, right? And so it was like this momentum that happened and things were building up and like there was electricity in the air and you could feel it. So then 
in my head, I'm still like, I'm still gonna, I can be here. I can just do the, be an advocate and so forth. Then an editor that I had met previously at SleuthFest at one of my conferences through my networking and so forth, who had read the first uh, a partial of my manuscript, uh, sends me uh, a, a DM, you know, she's like, hey, did you ever finish up that, that, that story, blah, 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 blah. And we started talking and so forth and so on. And that's how I eventually ended up publishing my, um, my culinary cozy series, uh, the Caribbean uh, Kitchen Mysteries. You know, and so, you know, I've always said this about publishing, at least for like traditional publishing, right? Is that it is, you know, it's like, you know, 33% talent, 33% skill, and then, you know, like 10% uh, perseverance, and then whatever that other percentage is, is luck. Because there's a there's a degree of luck that falls into it, you know. However, it happened, the stars aligned. I was there at the right place. Somebody remembered me. This, that, and the other. Because before that, full manuscripts that I had sent out, which were kind of in the same vein. I mean, my character was always going to be Cuban American. There was always going to be Spanglish in there, and I was always going to talk about um, some social justice issues. That's just who I am. Those threads were always in my work, even though I'm writing on the lighter side of cozy fiction, I mean, of, of crime fiction, right? I got a lot of lip service of, oh, this is exciting. We want to hear that. And then there wasn't the follow. And so you, you make assumptions about that. It's like, is it a numbers game? Yeah. Cause sometimes it is a numbers game, but also you just kind of know, none of it was direct, but you know. So you're a little uncomfortable with the Spanglish. You're a little uncomfortable with the Spanish. Well, you know, I'm not gonna change that because that's how my character speaks, you know? And so now on the other side of it, now that I'm published, I've got my second book. I just, I've got like um, five or six uh, short stories out in beautiful anthologies that are, you know, getting notoriety and this, that, and the other, you know, uh, I read the reviews and the issue is always, well, you know, I really like the character and I really like the stuff and so on, but you know, there's a lot of Spanish and it's not directly translated. I know I'm, I'm talking about the, the elephant in the room, right? So yes, you know, th this is, you know, it is translated. It's translated in context, okay? occasionally there's not a word that's translated because that's not for every reader. That word that I put in is for some very specific niche, very, very specific cultural thing. You know, somebody, some interview I was doing, somebody said, this is, oh, it's like an Easter egg. Yeah, it kind of is. It's kind of like an Easter egg for that one little, you know, but I try to do that on many different levels for all the different readers that are out there. And so, you, as an author, why would I not want my reader to understand my story? Of course, I'm going to make it as clear as possible, but I'm not going to bend and change myself into something else. I know that that is what, um, for generations, for decades, we can even say for 400 years, you know, that, they, that there has been one model of the way things need to be and the rest of us were not quite that person. Like you could pass for that, you could have entry into those places, but you were never in the inner circle for those places. And so you always had to code switch and, 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 and you know, contort yourself into other things. And I just refused to do that. And so I have uh, gotten off on a tangent and I'm going to leave it like that because I could talk about this and go on and up. Can I just say spoken word poetry? And that's all I'm going to leave it at that and, and go. Yes, thank you, uh, Raquel. So we're I'm going to um, ask us, um, all of you, a um, couple of questions sort of as we wind this down. And given that we're kind of up at the top of the hour here, 
uh, maybe we can be um, as succinct as possible, given that this is like our job as storytellers is to tell stories. Um, but yeah, one one question would be, um, is there something like quirky about your, I don't know, your writing habit? Uh, many of us, you know, have, you know, we have certain rhythms, certain things, but is there some uh, like a quirk that you have about, you know, when you write, I don't know, a favorite thing you eat or a, a something that you have to have happening when you're writing? Um, just just a little insight. Um, and then and then my next one, which is just, you know, a quick, quick title or author. What are you reading right now? And finally, what do you recommend to our viewers? I mean, there's been so much knowledge here that's been shared already, but is there something um, that, you know, in a kind of elevator pitch version, you can say, just do this if you want to go into this field or be, be warned about this. Um, so yeah, so the first one, a, a quirk. Um, second, a title or author that's exciting you right now. And third, um, a little push it forward piece of advice. Uh, Alex. Sure. Um, my writing method is the anti-quirk method. I minimize any kind of thing I need to do to get to the keyboard. So I guess my quirk is I just go to work. I don't need a candle or I don't need certain music playing. It's not a criticism of people that need certain things. It's just, I have two small children. I have a lot of stuff going on. And so I, I write in sprints. If I have a quirk, it's that they're asleep. I can tap away for 20 minutes and I have to be ready to just dive in. Um, what am I reading? Uh, I'm reading the new book uh, by Amina Akhtar. She just came out with Kismet, which is an amazing like takedown of the Sedona um, wellness industry from Thomas and Mercer. I'm beta reading her next book, which it's one of those, I think the best books are the ones that just stick in your head and you just can't stop thinking about those characters and what they're going through. And I just, I finished it last weekend and I'm still kind of wondering like, wow, what, what happened? What's going on with this? Um, my best bit of advice to any writer aside from the nuts and bolts stuff is be part of the community. I was part of the crime fiction community, like Raquel was saying. I was a fan. I was going to BoucherCon as a fan. I was, you know, involved in different organizations and just there just I wanted to kind of get a sense of what was going on and I can't tell you how many times new writers are like wow I, I'm my my book is coming out and I don't really you know I, I don't have a network of what to do like start building that network even before you even know you're gonna be a writer like you know be a fan let yourself enjoy the community and be supportive you know I always try to pay it forward as much as I can uh, whether it's like trying to mentor new writers or, you know, be being gracious and and uh, and giving with blurbs or advice and, um, you know, be the author that you wish you had as a newcomer helping you when you were coming up. So beautiful. Thank you, Richie. Wow. Uh, my quirk is I get up at five o'clock every morning, a part of a, a part of a Twitter uh, club called 5 a.m. Writers Club. I always hashtag. see that. Like, oh yeah. My God. And yeah, I'm up every morning and I do it. Now, it doesn't mean I'm actually writing, but I'm sitting down and trying to write. Oh and the other side of that is I reward myself with plantain chips and bourbon, uh, you know, uh, around four o'clock. That's that's a good writing day. Um, a writer I'm reading right now is Aya de Leon, uh, Undercover Latina. It is a uh, middle grade YA uh, spy novel that's uh, that's very good, really lived in world. Uh, and if anything, for advice, I would say, uh read like crazy read 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 and this is one advice I, I teach creative writing i tell my students accept that the first draft is garbage accept that before it destroys you it is garbage it needs work and the real writing is in the revision succinct yes. trying to be succinct i love that um definitely i can take that piece of advice <laughs> um gloria um Work probably in my writing um, schedule because I don't have a writing schedule. I have a full time job, and I have four kids and a huge like a house to to clean and all that sort of stuff. So I write wherever I can fit it in, and I do need quiet and stuff. So my um, fiance Tim is amazing, and he whenever we can because we're busy, he will grab all the kids and he'll take them out to like the park or something like that, so that I can have that quiet time, which is literally probably the only reason that I was able to write an entire novel um, and halfway through my next. Uh, and then what am I reading? 
I just finished reading Mexic Mexican Gothic. I really liked it. Um, and um, I, so sorry, I don't know the title of the book um, because my brain's like melting right now, I think. But J.J. Hernandez, he has just published the second book. I really liked his first one. So I would Google him and maybe I'll send you a link to his stuff. But it was really good. Like, it was really, really good. I really liked it. Um, his second book's on the way to my house and I can't wait to get it so I can read that. And then I forgot your third question. Oh, the um, advice to people that want to write. Read a lot. I know that there's a couple, there's like some people that say you don't need to read a lot. I don't think that's true at all. I think you need to read a ton. I think it's the research and the education that you need. And then write short stories. If you want to write short stories, write short stories. If you want to write novels, write short stories. Because especially with word counts, because I think it helps you become more succinct as a writer and it, it, it helps you trim out all the fat. So when you finally get to editing that first draft, um, you'll be a lot better at it because you're used to kind of getting a story and narrowing it down. So those, that's my big advice. Beautiful. Thank you, uh, Raquel and then Ida. Okay, so my quirk is, I mean, I'm at 5 a.m. a writer's club too. Um, and I'm with Gloria, it has to be quiet. Um, but I, I've gotten better at that. Basically, I can't have the mundane world enter my life. You know, like, don't tell me about the news. Like, I can, I can be on Twitter because it's words that I'm reading. But, like, for some reason, like, sounds about the outside, like, it just zoop, takes me away, right? Um, what now I'm reading is... A uh, Sinister Graves by Marcy R. Rindon. She is freaking amazing. It's a pretty short book. I've um, I've saved the last little uh, few bits, few pages for tonight so I can finish it up. But um, it's just like the way she talks about the environment, the quietness of the book. I, I really love that part of it. She's, it's just great. Read that. And again, I'm going to have to uh, agree uh, with what everybody else has already said. You know, you, you need to be in community, I think, to be a writer because we write alone, but we don't have to be alone in it. And, um, you know, find your community, find, go to conferences, even if it's not your specific genre, just go meet people. It helps so much to hear what other people have done. Absolutely. Ida. I don't think I have any quirks, but um, I need quiet. Um, and mm -hmm. I have two little kids as well. That's very hard to come by. Um, right now I'm reading Pricing Strategies by Craig Martell. It's a uh, nonfiction about pricing. <laughs> um, I would say um, I'm an extrovert though. So caveat, I know that many writers are not, but I'm an extrovert. When I went to RWA in 2019, um, I started snapping pictures. I opened up a Facebook um, and a Twitter. I don't think you need to do all of the things, but you should do one or two that you like. Um, I would post every once in a while and it would get one or two likes. Now I try to post at least once a day and every day I have 30, 40 likes and people and you know, sharing. Um, I don't think you need to join five different things but you should have one or two where readers can contact you um and if you just nurture that it grows organically um the other thing is i'm a pantser when i first started i you read all these things about you have to have a plan and you have to have a plan and you know write down an outline and do this and for me it didn't work i tried it and i was like this is not happening so then um, I read about pantsing. I just, I started writing. So I'm a discovery writer. That's what we're calling it now, a discovery writer. So I just sit there, I have an idea and I write it. I don't think you need to follow what other people are doing. If you want to plot, go and plot. If you want to plan it, plan it. If you just want to sit there and write it, go and do that. Because we're all different. We all have different methods of doing things. So the processes are different. Um, I don't think you need, I mean, everybody's like, oh my God, go plot. Why are you planning it? Uh, no, because my brain doesn't work like that. My mother's here doing something in the background. I have no idea what she's doing. Um, so all of us have a different process of doing it. 
you have to figure out which process works best for you. Um, and that's how you make the story. You just sit there and you do it. Wow. Well, I what can I say? It has been a huge honor to have been in this space with such Latin excellent writers. Um, so much wisdom, so much to share with us. Your journeys are, are incredible. You are role models to all of us. It's wonderful to hear of such kind of diverse ways that you've come to writing and the ways that you inspire us um, to continue on our paths as writers and readers, as active shapers and transformers of the world that we live in. Thank you, all of you, so much. Yes. Thank you so Very much nice. for having Thank us. You. This is a great conversation. Thank you. Good to see yes. everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. Much. Great to meet everybody. Thank so you, Fred. Thank you everyone again for tuning in. Um, this video will be on our YouTube channel for you all to share and for everyone else out there watching right now. Um, if your answer question didn't get answered right now, feel free to keep asking them and go find everyone on Twitter. That's where I primarily do my social media. I know people are on Facebook and TikTok and Instagram, but Twitter, if real quick, if you guys want to drop your Twitter handle or the best way people to reach you, that way our audience can go find you and maybe get their questions answered. I'm Latina Sluice across all platforms. All Type right. in Latina Sluice, you're going to find me. I'm Richie underscore Narvaez on Twitter and RNZ1000 on Instagram. I'm at Alex underscore Segura on Twitter and Alex Segura Jr. on Instagram and alexsegura.com. I'm Duca Ryder. I'm Duca Ryder on Instagram and Twitter, and Duca Author on Facebook. I can't remember mine. <laughs> <laughs> on title by, by Gloria. On title. I have my Facebook is untitled by Gloria because that's the last thing I figure out is the title. Um, <laughs> my, you know what? Go to GloriaLucas.com. That's my there website. All that there. Works. Yeah, that's. <laughs> well again thank you all for taking some time to to connect and share your stories with us here at pop cult x we really want to make this a platform for everyone to be celebrated and and lift up because i think myself i'll just a little background i am half mexican half jewish i never really grew up with either so i didn't really know how to identify oh. and as i've been going through this process as professor latinx would tell you i've been discovering what it means what my Latinidad means to me. So hearing your stories and hearing um, and reading your stories, really, it's really um, playing an impact on myself. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for sharing. And thank you all for being here.